geologist for 50 years. She really doesn't look like she <laughs> geologist for 50 years. She has three degrees in geoscience, the last one a doctorate from Colorado School of Mines, where she has been on the faculty part time since 2000. She was also a geologist in the oil and gas industry between 1980 and 2015. Now and throughout her career, she is engaged with geology societies and boards. She is a past president of the Rocky Mountain Association of Geologists and thanks them for their opportunity to talk to you tonight. Currently, she is on two philanthropic foundation boards and is on the board of directors of Dinosaur Ridge. In the past six years, Donna pivoted to geoscience outreach, writing a book on the geology and mining history of Golden, Colorado, leading community field trips, giving talks to groups such as tonight, and discussing geoscience with middle and high school students. A fun fact about Donna is she never met a rock she didn't like. <laughs> Um, on the back table, there are uh, there is a sign that if you take a picture of the little square, uh, it will give you access to a free ebook. Uh, Donna has also contributed a couple of door prizes for us, beautiful door prizes. So I hope everybody has a ticket. If not, we'll get you one after the program. Okay, please welcome. Donna, Dr. Donna Anderson. Now that is a, that's a concept that has grown kind of the history of science 
Over the last 200 years, people studying England, France, and other parts of Europe started collecting fossils because they were really interesting. And they started documenting them and observing that certain fossils only occurred in certain rock layers. So they put them together in, in a column with the oldest on the bottom, and they found out that there were groups of fossils that would change as you kind of went up this, this geologic column in the surface of the subsurface of the Earth. And they, they started, instead of saying fossil X, Y, Z, Q, R, and then fossil A, B, C, D, they assigned those names for time periods. So we have time period names like the Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. Then we kind of group those into bigger time periods like the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic. The change to any one time period is, is where a group of fossils goes extinct. They don't occur anymore as you go up the section. There's two places, if you look on the left here with the big arrows, there's two places in the last 500 or so million years where there were gigantic extinctions. And we'll talk about both of those. One is at the boundary between the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, the lower arrow, a gigantic extinction. And then the one that you call the Earth, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, is a big, big extinction. It wasn't quite as big as the uh, uh, older one. So we'll talk about this. But things really change at those boundaries in terms of fossils. So that's what marks the change over to these various main time periods. So then reading the rock layers, which happens to be my specialty in geology. If you, I'm sure most of you have gone to the Grand Canyon or seen the Grand Canyon, and you know all the amazing rock layers there. Well, it turns out that there are similar rock types, like the Red Wall Limestone. It occurs all the way through the canyon, <coughs> east to west. It occurs up in Utah. It's all over the place. And then and in the Grand Canyon, they decided to name that rock formation, the red wall. They gave it a name. It also has fossils in it. Oops. Yeah. Um, it has fossils in it that tell you the geologic time period. So we find out that the red wall limestone is Mississippian in age. Okay, fair enough. Where the rock layers change, sometimes there's a whole bunch of fossils missing or other formations are missing. You go somewhere else and find those rocks, but not in the Grand Canyon. So that gap is called an unconformity. And there's various flavors. On the, on the map, on the column here, there's a, at the bottom, there's the uncolored group that's tilted, and then it's overlaid by flat layers. That's a type of angular unconformity. Where if something happened, it tilted up those layers, and then the stuff on top is flat. That was probably mountains that got built up and eroded down. Times. Okay. So, next. so, on the side of the geologic column, you see all these numbers, and those are the actual dates. Now, this is not talking about high school social things. Dating is radiometric dating in this case. So, since the 1940s, about the time of World War II, we have been able to date, radiometrically date rocks and figure out when those time boundaries were. So for example, the Cambrian, the bottom boundary is about 542 million years old. And that's all coming from age dates from unstable isotopes. So all you have to know is that these are the things that are radioactive, like radon gate gas in your basement is radioactive. Well, it's from decay of rocks that have certain elements like uranium going to lead, or potassium going to argon, and these are changes in the atomic structure. It's very regular. You can figure out how long it takes to go from one to the other, and that's how you date the rocks. So it's pretty precise. It's gotten better and better over the last 80 years with better scientific techniques. So that's how we get those numbers. So then we have moving plates and continents. Around 1912, a gentleman by the last name of Baker, Notice that South America and Africa looked like they could fit together. And as it turned out, there were fossils, like little images of those little animals and then some plants, that went right across the Atlantic where that fit would be really good. He kept looking around at India.
India, Australia, and Antarctica, and realized they kind of all would have fought, fit together too. <coughs> well, kind of fast forward, World War II, you had submarine warfare. Submarines were cruising around the Atlantic and Pacific oceans, especially the Atlantic, and running into mountain ranges on the seafloor under like 3,000 to 4,000 feet of water. What was that about? So people started realizing that the crust was very dynamic. And we evolved from continental drift to what we now call plate tectonics. So the next slide, we're going to run a little movie. And we're going to see what happens between South America and Africa, and then some of the others. So what we're going to see is what we call now the opening of the Atlantic Ocean, and see how those plates move. So here we go. South America is on the bottom right, left. Africa is on the right. And so you can see the United States and Africa are splitting first, and then finally it splits down to Africa and South America. At the same time on this side, there's a purple line where there's little bars. That's where one plate's going under another. That's the Andes Mountains today. So when the plates shift and spread apart, somewhere else a plate has to get opened it. And that's where you build mountain regions. So the, the idea of a good fit with some fossils across the ocean in the continental drift has now evolved from a very sophisticated understanding of how the crust has moved around and you can date when it happened by looking at the fossils and the radiometric dates, et cetera. It's a very big connected story. Okay. So now we get into ancient landscapes. So we draw pictures of what the land might have looked at millions and millions of years ago. Like, we try to visualize the Earth's surface at any given time. Our tools are fossils, sedimentary rocks, like the rock layers in the Grand Canyon, and stable isotopes, which are non-radioactive. And that's something that you and I have in our bodies, plants have in their cells, and then gets locked in the rock when the organism dies, and or the rock gets deposited. So they're always there in an instant of time when they get preserved and cut forward really powerful. So we see fossils at the top left, that's a chronoid. We see petrified wood, that would happen to be a petrified national park with petrified forest. And we know that chronoids live in the ocean. We know that trees live on the land surface. So there you have something about the ancient landscape right there. This is out near a um, range in Colorado. It's a Raven Ridge out off on the lower left. And as you can see, some reddish green shales transitioning these blocky layers. Well, that's going from a floodplain to a lake. You can see fossils of alligators and garfish and resistant beds. And on the, in the shales, you get to see plants that live on land. So you start to go, oh, we go land to lake, land to ocean. You can go a lot farther. On the lower right are the beautiful sandstone cliffs of Zion National Park with huge cross fitting. Those form an ancient sand dune. So we can start to, can start to go, okay, that's what the land surface looked at when those rocks were formed. So then we get to a graph that's taken 50 plus years to be able to show this. And this is all based on these little stable isotopes that I discussed or mentioned. Um, and you can find out going back 500 million years when the Earth was super hot the red graph, and when it was super cold. And what that means is that when it was super cold, called ice house climates, that was a world without polar ice, no ice in the poles. Today we do have ice in the poles. The hot house has a world without polar ice climates, none, zero. And part of that evidence comes from stable isotopes, many, many, many rocks and measuring that in the mass spectrometer in the lab, looking at fossils, looking at rocks. There's glacial deposits that tell you where the glaciers, when the glaciers might have been. So this graph has evolved um, quite a bit over the last 50 years. This is probably the best rendition. But we see some real trends. We see some times when, wow, that red line is really prominent in a long time. We can see the ice house, the blue, kind of wiggling around in the middle. And you can see kind of where we are today at the far right side. So we're going to take all of these things and go into the time machine for you. And I'm on the far side, so. Okay?
So let's get into the time machine. Okay, and we're going to start with Red Rocks, or the Red Rocks Park, around 300 million years ago. And I want to just mention, Red Rocks are actually red because of rust. Just like a day on rust, when you put hair on it, that's what happens to rocks. We have little iron minerals in there, we expose it to the atmosphere, and voila, you have red rocks. So it's really simple why these are red. You see these all over the western US, you see things in New Jersey, you see them in Europe, and it's red rocks that have basically rusted. So we'll start with red rocks at the foot of what we call an ancestral Rocky Mountains. And we were at sea level. The tropical, it was a tropical climate. We were only like five degrees north of the equator, which is pretty close to the equator. Today we're at about 40 for your preference. And we were in an ice house climate. The green bar over there, we'll just cap that graph, is kind of a little icon where we were. We're in a predominantly blue weekly lines in there, which means there was a lot of ice in the poles. It was glaciers melting and coming back, coming back, cycling around. So there's a lot of changes in sea level, because every time the ice melts, the sea level rises. So you see that in the rock record. That's, again, one of my specialties to do. So let's go to the next. So I'm going to show you a series of maps in here, courtesy of um, a really neat guy, Dr. Ron Blakey, who's been working on these renditions of what did the world look like at any time. He's been working on this for like 25 or 30 years. And so I'm going to be showing these little called paleo geographic maps. And the red dot will always be where we are right here. So for your reference. You can also see state boundaries. So you can see Colorado. Uh, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico will kind of center on that. We see the West Coast somewhere on the far left side. So at this time, right here, um, we were on the coastal plain near the foot of the mountains. There's what's called the Ancestral Rocky Mountains, the little, um, where the little lines are pointed. They were pretty high. Nobody knows exactly how high they were. They might have had some place in them. They were high enough through glacial times. Um, and we were kind of at the foot of that. The rest of the United States, if you flew over and went to an airplane, you would not recognize today. We have no good reference for that. But it was in a lot of shallow seas with seas and white stones being deposited. Where California is today, there was a little bit of a few mountain ranges, but the planes were kind of moving around a little bit and causing little linear mountain ranges to pop up. And that was the ancestral Rockies, which pretty much follow the front range today is the same place. So that was number one mountain range formed here in, in, that became the Rockies. So now I'm going to show you the three kind of, here's a rendition of what the Red Rocks time, the fountain formation, uh, like at Red Rocks Park, Roxborough Park, would have looked like if you walked across the landscape. And on the right, the rocks that are showing you that, uh, that was a river channel deposit where the label is on top. And you can see the arrow pointing to a, a curvy line. That's the bottom of a channel. that carved into the underlying rock, and then it's a very coarse sand conglomerate on top, which means the rocks were deposited by very fast flowing rivers. So we can do a rendition like this and look and decide, OK, there's some flat channels, there's some very odd looking trees because there were no actual trees like we know today because they're all very ferns. So that's a rendition of what that looked like. And there's a, down at the bottom, there's an odd looking animal um, that might have lived at the time. So you kind of, and there's the Rocky Mountains, the ancestral Rockies in the background. So if you took off the trees and put something modern, you recognize it probably would look super different from today. There were no grasses then, so you could add that in. Anyway, so the next, the next rock layer that's not everybody's probably heard of is the Lions Formation, Lion Sandstone. That's a very famous building stone in Denver. All those nice red flagstones that you see around town and maybe in your backyard you have flagstone patios. That's made from the Lion Sandstone, which is on top of the found moon and red rocks formations. That is formed in a sand environment. So here you have a big dune field. Again, you have some rivers flowing through it, some ferns, um, 
we find, this is a slab of sandstone we have at the Lions Museum of Earth Science that has some little tiny footprints in it. These are called tetrapods, which is the technical term for a four-footed animal. Pretty nice word for a pretty simple thing. One of the guys that may have been cruising around out here um, was a really kind of reptilian um, with a big fin on the top called a matronon. And so they were kind of walking around the sand dunes looking for something to eat. Um, insects. I don't think insects were. Yeah, insects were there. So that was, that was kind of early insect vegetation. So this is kind of the, the, the landscape of the lion sandstone. And then the third rendition is a really austere looking rendition of these little mountain things with um, ocean water around them. And this is the light exploration, which is definitely not so famous. Nobody's probably heard of that in here. Um, but the climate at this point got super hot. We started to go out of that glacial period, leave it. It got very hot and very lucky water, technical term for highly saline. <laughs> Um, and the only thing that could live in there are little lamination of fossil algae, which are shown here in the picture with the pencil point. Every one of those laminae, those little tiny lines, is a, a little mat of algae that died, and they got covered up, and then the next one kind of got on top on top. There's just probably a hundred of those little lines in there. And they're like fossil algae. If you've ever been to Shark Bay, Australia, that would be a good analog for this. And those little mountainy things are called stromatolites. They're very interesting fossil. They generally reflect very severe ocean conditions. So what happened? Things got changed. Remember in that time I showed you about the, the change from the Paleozoic to the Mesozoic time period? At the end of the Paleozoic, at the end of those slimy rocks, we had a huge volcanic eruption sequence on the Earth surface. This is, we are here is about where we are right now. So this is what the whole continents would look like uh, in the uh, late, late Permian. And then the right at the top of the red dots is a huge igneous province that people now think is what happened. It blew up so much stuff in the atmosphere. It polluted all the oceans. It ruined life on Earth. And it was the great dying at 252 million. It was a massive extinction. 90% of all species in the ocean and on land went extinct. And, um, wait for that. Sorry. Yeah, so it was, um, people now have kind of figured out from the geochemistry of a lot of sedimentary rocks that were deposited at this time, there's a big nickel um, and other heavy metal kind of um, signature in those rocks. And that's why they think it's probably due to this massive volcanic eruption sequence up in the Siberian here, but today is the Siberian here. Otherwise, you wouldn't probably recognize the continents if you over in there. So now we're going to go to the Mesozoic. Um, after the Great Extinction, we had the breakup of the continents. The big mass you saw started to split up. Eventually, the North Atlantic opened, the South Atlantic opened. The place began moving out of the equator and northward, eventually, by the end of the Cretaceous, to about where we are today, at 38 degrees north. However, we were still in a tropical climate, or subtropical. Well, why is that? Because there was no polar ice, and we were in that green bar there, with mostly red, and the earth was hot, very hot. Um, and had a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In fact, some people think up to 2,500 parts per million carbon dioxide, which you and I wouldn't like breathing. So it was a very different climate on Earth, and it was very, very hot. So it also brings us to the real Jurassic Park, which in the United States is this area kind of outlined in the green polygon. There's this Stegosaurus, our Colorado State fossil. There's an Allosaurus where the bones were first found at Dinosaur Ridge at Morrison. You can go see some of those bones on the field trip. And there was a huge inland area with rivers and lakes. It was kind of it was kind of a savanna, but it wouldn't be like going to Africa. You wouldn't exactly recognize the plants, but you would see herds of dinosaurs out there, huge herds of dinosaurs. So it was the first kind of 
serenading for the United States. And that Brent Dottis were we are today. Um, and it really on the age of the dinosaur. I had to put this in here. I mean, this was great. This was a dinosaur national monument. And some way, this goes, you know, what about all the dinosaur people? I mean, they were so big. I mean, you know, there's a fever there. I think it was an Alice one. But that's the same label that you have for the meteor hit. But that thing is a human for scale. That thing was huge. These guys were huge animals. They had huge bodies. And one way just could not resist about doing this thing about the volume of dinosaur. We, we you know, really felt swimming pool and going on and on, so I just bring that to your attention. <laughs> but it was a savanna. It was um, fern trees and algae and lakes and ponds, and you had huge, um, that would be like a patasaurus in the background, running all over this massively large uh, inland plain. So that was kind of the forest of formation, and that's one of the big formations you'll see Sorry. in this route. So now we go to the Western Interior Seaway. We leave the Jurassic, and there's a movie running. You see the blue getting bigger and bigger, and our we're in the middle. There was an ocean coming in from the Arctic. Then you have the Gulf of Mexico now in the lower corner on the lower right. And that sea kept connecting and shrinking and swelling. Over time, eventually getting really connected, getting really big, expanding, and we were underwater, folks. We were in the ocean. This is the Western Interior Seaway that dominated the Cretaceous period. At the end, the whole state of Colorado. Most half of Utah, Nebraska, Kansas, north of South Dakota, most of Montana, half of Wyoming, most of New Mexico, all of Texas practically, was all in the big ocean. So up to a thousand feet deep. That's a debated number, but some people make that claim. That's why you can find oceanic marine fossils in Kansas. Colorado, Utah, blah, 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 et cetera, because we were under the ocean. Um, same latitude as today, about 38. Um, abundant sea life along the shorelines. You would get dinosaurs walking along the shorelines and make trackways. That's like at the other part of the east side of Dinosaur Ridge. It was a hot time. In fact, it was the green marsh shows you over there. Some people call it the Cretaceous Hot House. It was so hot. Which is not to say that it wasn't rain, because it was probably kind of a monsoonal climate, you know, with seasonal huge amounts of water and rainfall. But it was very, very hot and it was very, very tropical, cold, cold, there was no polar ice at all. So here's uh, two examples of the trackways. The one on the right is Dinosaur Ridge, where you'll go to on the field trip. The one on the left is Picket Wire, which is a very famous trackway down by La Junta, Colorado. It's in a river bed, so you can, you can walk on it and try to walk on it like a dinosaur. It's a lot of fun. We had really long legs. Um, and in the middle is one of these renditions of what did that landscape look like? And now we have a tree on the right that you might recognize as kind of a ginkgo tree. They have lots of ferns, very tropical. You have by uh, bays and stuff along the shoreline. There's no way we were running into the ocean at the time. So it was, it was a nice place for those dinosaurs to live. They were very lucky. And the other thing that happened is where there was not really a shoreline, you had a floodplain where you had swamps. And here on the floodplain deposit, when you had the excavation at Windcrest, there was a bunch of Triceratops bones found. This happens a lot around Denver. Um, people will be excavating a foundation and dig up bones, and they will call the Denver Museum of Nature and Science out to do some work to preserve those. And this is the example of finding that at Windcrest a few years ago. And then in, in Golden, there's a Triceratops trail. It's a really nice example of a swamp. Um, there's coal that used to be mined there, clay. And there 
those huge palm tree fronds, which you can kind of see in the shadow there, they were massively large palm trees. I take second graders out there and I go, do you see palm trees growing here today? And they go, no, no. Well, they don't. They need in a much warmer, more moist climate. So it's a really different time here. So cause everything kind of has to come to some end at some point. And toward the end of the Cretaceous, around 70 million years ago, we had the second Rockies kind of rising up here. Um, there was lots of plates running under the continent on the west coast. There was mountains rising. It transmitted into the interior more. The sea retreated, because as the plates and the mountains rose, the sea level would retreat, right? So you aren't at sea level anymore, so there's no sea. Um, and the second layer of live mountains arose, and again, pilots ranches at the foot of those mountains that are gone. And then these changes. <laughs> 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 Um, by 64 million years, so you hit, hit the asteroid at 66 
by 64 million years, we were back to a tropical rainforest. And that's the rendition of the cute little memo at the bottom. Um, there's another excavation that Denver Museum did when I-25 was being reconstructed down here um, in the early 2000s, and Kirk Johnson was involved in this. They, when he got a CDOT, uncovered a bunch of fossil leaves. It's, it's basically the remnants of a rainforest. And there's a hand for scale, and some of those leaves are huge, which is real typical of tropical vegetation. So they did a lot of studies on that, and from those, they figured from the leaves and the comparison to more modern versions, the estimated mean annual temperature of that area, this area around us, was 72 degrees, which is a lot warmer than today's average if you take a whole year's average. And the mean annual rainfall was 88 inches. <laughs> like New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's impressive. So it really was different. And it wasn't that far above sea level. We were still, you know, probably a couple hundred feet above sea level, but it was a tropical rainforest. So all things warmed up again, and I call it the hot time of the Cenozoic, my Eocene time. Again, the bar, rain bar there, we, we warmed up significantly to a very hot time. Um, the vegetation started changing. Um, we had palm trees at the North Pole, the South Pole. Uh, there were large lakes filling big areas of southwestern Wyoming around, um, oh, various parts of Utah, northeastern Utah, and northwestern Colorado. There were mammals everywhere. The first horses in North America kind of showed up a little tiny. They were like no bigger than a dog. They were very tiny. And that was kind of the, what's called the Paleocene, or Eocene thermal maximum. It's a very, very steady time of Earth's history. Again, carbon dioxide levels were very high, much higher than today, and the temperature was, you know, averaging around 75 or 80 mm -hmm. and it was pretty hot. Um, so it was kind of, it's, it's kind of like the next, uh, oh, I think a couple of you asked about that. At the same time of this general time, we had a big petrified forest all around here. But Cherokee Ranch, there's been a nice excavation down there of the petrified wood. This is taken from a scientific article. That wood is in the, um, the walls. We'll talk about the other side of the walls in just a minute. We have the samples on the back table. There's a big log with a nice leaf standing next to it. So this is the age of the petrified forest at Cherokee Ranch and various other places around here. And the other rock that's in the walls at Cherokee Ranch and Tweet Kimball's, Kimball's Mansion is rhyolite. It's an igneous rock. It's actually um, kind of a tuff, which is volcanic ash that, that is blown out of a volcano. People have now figure that that eruptive center was near Lake Vista and Mount Princeton. And it's kind of like, you know, the idea of burying Pompeii with Mount Vesuvius erupting. Well, this was Mount Vesuvius on steroids. This was huge, and it, it buried this whole area around here, Castle Rock. Um, it didn't quite, uh, we don't know if it quite reached up to gold, and there's no evidence left, so we have a you know, wild guess on it. But it was a very large area that got this tough in it, filled in all the valleys, and killed all the vegetation, and the one in front of that rendition of what it might look like as it's rolling down to where it's hotter than you know what. So um, that is what made the tough that is a big building stone all over Denver. So the castle at Cherokee Ranch is mostly made of that with some little pieces of petrified wood. A lot of the buildings in downtown Denver are made of the mountain tough and it's a very common uh, rock and building stone in the front range. So then we had a lot of long period of erosion. The mountains wore down, the land surface wore down, but in since it was a widespread savanna. Now this picture is a picture in the Kalahari Desert of Botswana. It is a desert. Look at all the grass. Look at the trees scattered around. That's what a savanna looks like. That is probably what this area looked like different grasses and trees, but just kind of the scenery. 
And that's pretty much stuck around till the day. So when I just went down and created this really large flat plain, that's what we have here. And to the east. So you know this place. Yeah, that's Castle Rock. And talking about this erosion, um, somewhere around Castle Rock, I just put a red line, that used to be the land surface. So everything below it has been eroded over a long period of time, leaving Castle Rock as a remnant. Probably, you know, it took millions of years to get to today's surface, and where did the dirt go? It went to the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, it filled up what we now know as the Gulf of Mexico. Because that place is sinking and the rivers are going out, just like the Mississippi does, the rain just went out toward the Gulf of Mexico, and then the road and dirt went out and got deposited the out there. And so we had the second American Center Mini, I'll call it. The first was Jurassic Park. The climate did start to cool off quite a bit. Because we were actually starting to enter the glacial time we have today. We had lots of grasslands. There's the rendition again. Think of that other picture from the Kalahari. Grasslands, scattered trees, grazers, predators. Basically, if you go on safari, you would do it in this time, but you see a lot of different animals, right? Like some, some things that uh, brown sloths and huge bison and pigs, well, ancestors of pigs. The horses were getting bigger. So we had camels, yes, camels in North America. Pronghorn or antelope, we call them huge bison, brown sloth, rhinoceroses, elephants, and relatives. Many other animals on this plain right here in the Highlands Ranch area. And in Wyoming and Colorado. So, where our dot is, you can see that it's kind of flat. Everything to the west is mountainous. There's huge mountain building going on over uh, Utah, all the way to California, forming the um, Basin Range, Nevada. But we stayed here in the American Center again. <laughs> So the biggest change really occurred in the climate two million years ago. And that's when global cooling began to really start in earnest with that grenade bar, as you can see that blue line really steeply diving off. So during that time of the last two million years, at times we had obviously an ice in the poles. And sometimes that ice sheet covered the North Pole, all of Canada, the upper United States, and certainly a lot of Scandinavia and parts of Alaska. So it was huge. I mean, it was just solid ice. But that ice would melt and come back and melt and come back kind of cyclically over this two million, two million years time. So now we have a really good record of what happened in about the last million years from Antarctic ice cores. So this is taken, this data is taken from measuring gas bubbles trapped in the ice from Antarctica over the last 800,000 years. And so every time you see one of these little red spikes or pink spikes, that's a warming time. And all the blues are little cooling times. And those are ice ages. So you had warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, just over and over and over, over the last million plus years. And the temperature changed with that, of course, with the worldwide temperature and the carbon dioxide, which is also measured out of the same gas levels. The carbon dioxide shows similar patterns. That's, that's it. And then we're in the last ice age, or actually the very last interglacial on the far right. And I want to talk about a couple of fossil deposits in the last interglacial and then bring it up to today. So, how many of you have heard of the snow mass um, big out there of snow mass? Okay, so yeah, so that was um, that was another Denver museum. I guess I'll call it a salvage operation because an uh, operator was digging a pond for a reservoir, and all of a sudden this was this is um, maybe 10 or 15 years ago now, there were all these moments, like, man, this moment is huge. Moments. So I called the Denver Museum, 
it was like, oh my gosh, you guys got to come out here because we want to finish this up. And we know it's important. And it was very important. Um, this uh, on the left side here is the deposits they found um, span the last interglacial, that pink spike, pink spike, into the, the early part of the last ice age. That's the dating they got on that. Um, it was an ancient lake filled between 140 and 55,000 years ago. They found thousands of bones, big and small, 50 species, at least 35 American mastodons, which is like an elephant relative, all centers of ages, insects, fossil woods with logs up to 30 feet long. And but the species are real familiar. Fir, Douglas fir, spruce, pine, ponderosa, sagebrush, oak and juniper. Those are species we're all familiar with. So the species were the same, but in these two renditions, the kind of upper one shows like the warm time, there weren't any ice from ice glaciers in the mountains around there. It looked pretty much like it does today. And then in the cooler times, they had glaciers on the canyons. Um, and there was some evidence that there was some glacial ice, so it still uh, was quite close to the pond. And there's a mastodon on there, a shoreline, and some brown sloths. So again, you had camels. I don't know if they found camels, but you had mastodons, bison. It's kind of the same species you find out on the savannah, but this was in a more alpine setting, so it was a very, very special thing. The last glacial period. So how much ice was there in the Colorado mountains? This is work that a friend of mine, Vince Matthews, who was a state geologist and now retired, has been working on this book, which I have cited in the end of this. If you, 18,000 years ago, where that rain bar is, you're still in what's called the maximum ice stage, the last glacial maximum in the, in the world. Um, if you went up ice to Empire, and you tried to go to um, out of the springs, and you decided you wanted to go to Georgetown or Empire, you could not. It was a wall of ice. And the, there's actually some de glacial deposits at the intersection where the two roads split. They're called moraines. They kind of map to the maximum down the valley extent of that, those two ice glaciers, basically. So there's our dot. You know, I-70 is just to the west of that dot. There's the blue shows the ice. So there's a lot of ice all over the mountains of Colorado. If you go hiking and enjoy alpine hiking, you can see lots and lots of glacial features. The beautiful cirques we see today when we go hiking, these were all carved in the last ice ages. Makes our beautiful scenery of the Rocky Mountains. Okay. So we'll go kind of fast forward, I guess, here. Um, then we'll talk about um, a really another famous place right near here called Land Spring. And this is a this records a time after the last glacial maximum, after the ice had really melted out. And the green water on the left is about 13 to 11,000 years ago. And that's the mammoth, camel, brown sloth, bison, um, bones that have been excavated out of the Land Spring spring deposit, which is a pond deposit. So those were all the American savannas so there maybe 13,000 years ago. The other thing that's also special about this was the paleo Indian human hunting that's been documented at that site that dates to about 7,500 years ago. And the fauna that they were hunting was essentially the same as bison, camel, and was mouse those animals were still surviving at least to 7,500 years ago in this area. They were cruising around on our, you know, American Serengeti at the time, um, but they became extinct shortly thereafter. And the controversy has only always been why did they could become extinct after humans showed up. I'll leave that to your imagination. Okay. And so here's what Land Spring looked like in 1961 when they first excavated it. Um, oops. And then here it was, you know, I, was, I went out there because I thought it was so cool, and I have to credit um, one of the docents who was a former uh, co worker of mine, Betsy Kilo, and she gave a really nice talk on this, so I got all of the right dates and stuff. But this is what it looks today. Here's what it looked like when 
the excavated 1961. You can see some curved tusks here. Those would be the um, Columbian mammoths, which are uh, pretty big animals. And then there's mice and bones. And that's also where they found some of the human evidence of um, having cut the bones, which they could make them a little bit younger in the, in the excavation. So where are you today? Today, I simply end an office with this slide. Yeah. Um, so, so this is the end of the adventure. <laughs> and you know, you guys stuck with it pretty good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, and I say, as it kind of shows in this cartoon, in your knowledge, don't play with unknown dryers. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a lot of acknowledgments to make, many, many acknowledgments. Um, Vince Matthews, the Billy E. Deep Time Mass, um, Dinosaur Ridge colleagues, Bob Reynolds, who thought I was giving way too ambitious a talk for all of you because he thought I would need about three hours to go through it. Um, Herbert Shields, Amy Atwater, Larry McCall, Kurt Johnson, who's now at Smithsonian, James Hackenberg, who's a good colleague. Um, I really thank the Army G Outreach Committee for, you know, Sarah for asking us. Okay. And, um, Betsy Keeley from um, Mount Spring and Rocks Grove Park. Apologies to Gary Washington. <laughs> So you kind 
have to think in that regard that a few humans came in into this herd that must have been like Nirvana to them to see all these animals out on this, this American Serengeti. They had great pickings for hunting. And I think there's some truth to the fact that hunting pressure causes the leave North America. But it's also true that the climate was changing radically. It was warming up. The, um, the grasses were getting we had to evolve into something that could survive with less rainfall. So there was a lot of ecological pressure from the climate change going on as well as the human pressure. Does that kind of help answer? That was too much of a question. I have a question. Uh, this is a very fascinating subject. What I'm curious about is do you have any idea at this point the changes that has happened on this planet? Is that basically internal to the planet, or is it the combination of what's happening out in space and what's happening in the planet? So right now, given our state of knowledge, both on the planet and in, in planetary geology, I'll call it, we, we just apply that it would be internal to the planet. Um, however, it's not exactly with that asteroid impact in, at the Cape boundary, we'll call it the UG boundary. So there are extraterrestrial things going on. If you look at, it's an interesting scientific story to um, read about the discovery of the KT boundary. It's a really good uh, book that was written in the mid-90s by um, the gentleman who, and I can't remember the name, sorry, but found, defined the KT boundary about the history of that. People rejected that. The papers came out about it in the 1980s, like, no way. <laughs> Not that it happened. Well, they kept going. They invented, they invented science to answer those questions. And I guess to me, that was part of that growing up, too. I was like, oh, really? But then I saw a, an asteroid hit Jupiter. And you remember that? I mean, uh, I'm convinced. <laughs> These are long, low frequency events, but they do come and cause great havoc to a planet like ours. So in that regard, there is extra, there's out of planetary influence. Beyond that, I, I can't say. Just a real quick question. Uh, you point your presentation, you had uh, illustrated different temperatures, average temperatures at like, various times. What's the average temperature right now throughout the whole world? Uh, oh, oh. I'm not, I, I'll go to I shouldn't have looked that up. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when I um, well, uh, I know the average carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide is 420 parts per million or so, and that contrasts greatly with the heat seeking of the Cretaceous estimates of 2500. But um, yeah, I just, they don't, yeah, I, don't know. I have to say, I didn't okay. look that up, and I could do that, I could Google it, you know, and do that. Thank you. Al Gore had that movie, An Inconvenient Truth, where he talked about how scared we should be of CO2. And you're one grab of the CO2. It truly seems a very shallow dog. So, so that movie was not bumped then. It's no. a controversial movie. No, it, it, it is so controversial. I mean, there's, yeah, there's controversy around it. I think as a scientist, I've seen so much evidence that um, that. that Huge spike coming back up is actually real. What was the size of the asteroid? Yeah, that's actually the, the asteroid was like six to ten miles long. Yeah. 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 You showed the picture where the horses were the size of the dogs. <laughs> and yeah. I recently learned that the horses that we have in this country came from Europe. Yes. Oh, that's another cool story. The horses evolved on the North American continent, but they were they were gone. Just like the, the camels, the elephants, they were basically 
gone uh, under about 7,000 or so years. And they had to be reintroduced when the Spanish, when the Spanish came in the 1650s, 1600s. They brought horses with them. And they repopulated their, their uh, traditional habitat. So, how did the Rocky Mountains form? I understand that normally they form with women and bad things. Yeah, so... We said we want animals in California. Yeah, so, so that's always been a fun thing to talk about, and there's been a lot more work on how to understand that, because it's easy to understand where a plate goes under another one, how that lifts the local mountains up, but then how do you get it far in? And so what happened in the Cretaceous, and this is going on in um, South America today, it's in Analog, in Bolivia, and then into Argentina. There's a place where the slab starts to flatten out. When that happens, it transmits stress way inland. And that is what happened in the Cretaceous that caused our Lenormand Rockies. Not only that, but reconstructing the seafloor with magnetic strikes. It looks like a huge, Oceanic plateau went down the subduction zone to be like stuffing, stuffing a turkey and just kind of putting more rock down there. And then that actually also made it flatten out. So that's what caused the, the Laramie Rockies to come in so far. And that's actually a pretty solid story. You know? yeah. um, you mentioned uh, about the Wyoli and the petrified wood at yeah. Cherokee Ranch. There's also conglomerate that they uh, use from the property. Is the conglomerate created from the oceans or anything significant? So, so I have to say I haven't looked at that, but generally the conglomerate around here is a massive river deposit. A big flood, big floods. During the time of the Wall Mountain Top, the, the climate was very monsoonal and there were many, many floods. And some of the floods are the, the deposits that are left that are actually on Sharpie Branch, I've seen those out rocks. They are like the biggest cross beds I've ever seen that aren't formed by a sand because let's look this way. If you're ever in a sandstorm, the grains are really tiny, which is good. Because if they were like that big, you would dead. You would be dead. So generally wind doesn't pick up sediment that size. So if you see conglomerate in the cross beds. That's probably a river deposit, like 99% sure it is. So they are out in Cherokee, and they are some of the biggest flood deposits I've ever seen. And they're pretty solid, so I'm guessing that's where they came from, locally. Somebody asked about the average temperature. Oh, the average surface temperature is around 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah.